Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free CompTIA a certification training course on CPU technologies. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to look at the requirements from CompTIA a 22701, section 1.4. We're going to go through a lot about CPUs. We're going to look at different types of CPUs, manufacturers of CPUs, and how the CPUs work underneath the surface. There's some really interesting technologies associated with just the CPU chips themselves that you'll need to know for your a exam. We're going to go through all the requirements from those exam pieces. First, let's talk about the different CPU types. There's two big manufacturers of CPUs, one bigger than the other these days. One that's uh, very well known is Advanced Micro Devices. They are the second largest microprocessor provider in the world. So the extremely large company and how they operate. And you can see a number of the names of the chips. You've probably heard of these before, all the way back to the K5 and K6, but the Athlon chips and the Duron chips, all the way up to the Fusion chips. In 2006, AMD bought a graphics company called ATI. So if you have a computer with an embedded ATI card or you've purchased an ATI card in the past, then you may have noticed that the new drivers are coming from AMD and not specifically an ATI company by themselves anymore, but they still use that ATI logo in what they're doing. The biggest manufacturer and provider of microprocessors in the world by far these days is Intel. And Intel probably has the most popular chips too, back to their x86 versions, the 386 and 486, all the way up to some of their more popular chips these days with the i3s, the i5s, and the i7s. Whenever you're looking at a computer, whether it's a Macintosh, a Linux machine, a Windows device, almost all of them these days are using chips that are either made by AMD or Intel. Even though you may ha only have a single CPU or CPU core inside of your computer, some of the things that are built into the CPU allow it to get a little bit of a speed boost. And one of these technologies is something called hyperthreading. Hyperthreading technology you may see abbreviated as HTT. And it's a way that you can take a single CPU, but inside of the CPU core, have it act almost like there are really two cores or two CPUs inside of this device. It isn't really duplicating the effort. You don't, don't get 200% more throughput, but if you're able to have a little more efficiency inside of the CPU, you actually get an interesting 15 to 30 percent performance boost with this. So there's some really nice functionality on these older style CPUs that have this hyper threading technology built in to get a little bit of a speed boost. The operating system itself must be able to take advantage of this hyper threading technology. If you're running something like Windows 2000, which was written before HTT was really implemented widely, then you aren't going to have this available to you. But pretty much the other operating systems that have come out since that time frame, you're going to be able to run hyper threading. In fact, you'll bring up your task manager. And even though you only have a single CPU inside, you may see that you actually have multiple CPUs, or it looks like there are multiple CPUs inside of it. Another important consideration when it comes to the performance of your CPU is something called the CPU cache. You'll notice that the cache memory is something that is almost always marketed along with the specifications and speeds of the computer itself. The reason that, it, that it's always included as the specification is that it's really important. The amount of cache you have in your computer can make a dramatic difference on the amount of speed you're able to get out of the CPU. This cache memory is in limited form because it is extremely fast, and it's pretty expensive. It's not something you could put all of the memory in your computer to be this fast. It's really something that's, that's a buffer on the front or the end of the processing going through the CPU. So you can kind of fill up the buffer and send the traffic through that CPU as quickly as possible. There are different kinds of caches. You'll hear these referred to as a level one cache and a level two cache and a level three cache. These initial and secondary and now even third level caches are on these days still on the, the CPU chip itself. These are not separate modules on your motherboard. By having it on the chip, you're able to get incredibly fast speeds out of it. So as we look at the specifications for a computer, and you can see that it's a CPU with this much of L1 cache and this much of L2 cache, that's what it's referring to. The more levels on the chip and the more amount of cache memory that's available, the faster that entire system is going to be able to run. If you were to grab a magnifying glass, a microscope, and you were to look at the details of the die of a CPU chip, 
it would look like this. It's a little city unto itself. This happens to be a quad core i7 chip and there's cache memory all over this. The, the one that really stands out, the most amount of cache memory we actually see on here is this L3 cache that happens to be on here. And you can see you've got these four little sections down here. There are four cores on this particular CPU. So there are four sections of cache memory that's allocated to each CPU. And you can see they're all lined up in a row. So whenever you look at a CPU, you'll be able to pull out these very common areas of the CPU. You may not know exactly what it is without referring back to the specifications from the manufacturer, but in things like this, especially cache memory, which takes up a lot of room, you can see it's a major part, a huge percentage, uh, probably about a third of this entire CPU is just for L3 cache memory. That's how important that cache memory is. If we go back in time to some of the early processors, you may still see some of these still running out there in the world. The Pentium 2, we're seeing fewer and fewer of those these days, but this entire chip here was the Pentium 2 processor. It was something that was slot-based, so it, it fit into a big slot that was on the motherboard. And the Pentium 2 was something that had both the processor and some cache memory on this big board that came along with it. So whenever you open up a computer and you see this big square thing sticking out of the motherboard, you're trying to find the CPU, that's what it is. It's this big square CPU pulling that you would pull the entire thing out and put in another one in if you wanted to. The Pentium 2 processor obviously was a little bit older and a little bit bigger. Our newer processors have become smaller and smaller and smaller. We've been able to put a lot more in a chip. And these days it's a single chip that you would simply put into perhaps a zero insertion force connector, a socket that's on your motherboard, and that's the way we work with it. But the uh, A-plus exam expects that you will know what the Pentium 2 was and what it looks like. I wanted to give you a representation of that. These days we have CPUs that are multiple cores. You'll see a dual core or a quad core. We're getting even more CPUs these days with more cores inside of them. Those are single physical chips, but on the physical chip, are separate CPUs. It's like we've taken multiple chips and crammed them into a single chip now. The multiple cores each have their own cache. We even saw a representation of that. We'll look at that again. And every chip itself usually has a shared cache associated with it. Uh, doesn't have to though, but that's one of the things that we'll see is that you'll have a CPU core with its own set of cache and there may be a separate bus interface with its cache set up. This isn't always what you see in a dual core, but that's a pretty good representation of the types of architectures that you will see in these multiple core technologies. If we look back again at that i7, I mentioned that this was a quad core and each one of these up at the top, this is one core, here's a separate second core, here is a third and a fourth core here. And I mentioned earlier that we had those different cache memory and our cache memory underneath was also associated with these cores. It's all lined up in a row. If we were to look at this from above, we can really see exactly where the different cores are delineated on this particular chip. Makes it very simple to see. If it's a dual core, there's two of them, you may see two, two broken up very symmetrical on the chip. And that's how it works. We've taken all that technology that used to be on multiple chips. It's now on a single die.